Proverbs 13 verse 10 says, Only by pride cometh contention, but with the well advised is wisdom. Wealth gotten by vanity shall be diminished, but he that gathereth by labor shall increase. Hmm. Very similar to the verses we just read back there in chapter 10. But by pride, only by pride cometh contention. You see, there's no contention when you're a humble person. All right? Yeah, they can mock you, they can make fun of you, whatever else. But, you know, just, okay, whatever. See ya. But you see, when you're prideful and you're, and you're arrogant, you're going to argue with people. Which leads to contention. You know what the best thing to do as a Christian is? When somebody's pushing pride towards you, and you see, I can't get anywhere with this person? Just say, okay, see ya. And walk away. Only by pride cometh contention. It takes two people to have an argument. If they want to argue with you, I, I'm sorry, I don't have time for that. See ya. I don't need to boast myself. And they go, oh, you coward. Look at you, you your little sissy. Oh, you're a coward, you chicken. Buck, 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 buck. And your pride goes, how dare they speak that way of me. I'm going to go back there and I'm going to tell that person. I'm going to get right in their face. I'm going to say, hey, you, you, yeah, you, there. You know, see, what is that? Pride. You don't need to answer everybody. Hey, we're all going to stand before God someday. It'll all work out. All of it. Every man shall give account of himself to God. Whether at the judgment seat of Christ or the great white throne judgment. Everybody's going to answer to God at some point in time. And he'll sort it all out. You don't have to have your pride get so big that you can't have people put you down. Because brethren, if you're a Christian, you're going to be put down by this lost world. This lost world is going to mock you. They're going to make fun of you. And if you're a prideful person, you're not going to be able to take it. It's just as simple as that. You're going to have to have people say nasty things to you and you just go, sorry about that. I'm praying for you. Walk away. And that's why, another reason why I've actually put almost all my videos to approval, you know, comments by approval only. And if things go really crazy in the future, I might just have to get rid of the comments. I don't know what I'm going to do there yet. Because a lot of my older videos that I had, all comments are approved automatically. I've seen these Christians, and they know the truth. And somebody gets on there, and they're just trying to, just trying to get them. You know, get their goat, as they say. And I see this, these comment battles. And they'll go on for months at a time. And it's just like the Bible says, in heretic, a man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition, reject. And I've seen Christians, Bible-believing Christians, argue with heretics for months at an end. And they'll put four, five, six comments, you know, these big continued, 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 continued. They'll put these things on. All this contention. Why? Pride. Pride. Hey, Brian, you, you're, you're awfully stupid. You stand for the King James Bible, and I can prove from my Greek professor and blah, blah, blah. Whatever. I got, I got work to do, man. I, you know, I'm busy. I'm too busy for that stuff. Sometimes I'll go in and I'll answer somebody. Somebody has a real genuine question, or, or they say something, and I'll just be like, okay, I'll answer this person because it'll help other people. But a lot of times, I don't have any pride to, to, you know, that I have to protect, a reputation that I have to protect. You want to call me an idiot? You want to call me lost? You want to call me whatever? Okay, go ahead. It's all going to be sorted out in the end. I don't need to worry about it. Proverbs chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. It says here, Every wise woman buildeth her house, but the foolish plucketh it down with her hands. He that walketh in his uprightness feareth the Lord, but he that is perverse in his ways despiseth him. In the mouth of the foolish is a rod of pride, but the lips of the wise shall preserve them. Hmm. Now, what did we read at the very beginning of this sermon? We read about Eve. What did she do? She was a foolish woman who plucked down her house with her own hands. There she is in a perfect garden of Eden. She had it made. Everything was wonderful. And what does she do? She's lifted up with pride and she says, I can speak 
better than God. I am wiser than the Lord. I can add to what the Lord commanded me. She was foolish. She plucked down her house with her hands. But it says there a wise woman will build her house, buildeth her house there. She won't do things to tear down her husband. She won't do things to tear down the home that God has given them. She'll do things to build it up, to make it a wonderful place for the Lord. But you see, when there's pride there, see, the wife comes home to her house and it's, it's just not quite as big as the neighbors, you know. And my vehicle isn't, isn't as new as my neighbor. Husband, uh, I think we need to get a bigger place. Because after all, I mean, uh, what do the ladies in town think of me? And I mean, I'm driving this old station wagon or this old whatever. I really need a new Suburban, you know. What's going on? She's got pride and she's plucking her house down. See? I gotta have a nicer dress. I gotta have a mink coat. I gotta have all these things because of my pride. Yeah. And a foolish woman will do that and cause her husband to work harder, which hurts the family more, and causes them to be in debt to the bank, which causes financial strain on the marriage, and pretty soon, there's talk of divorce. Happens all the time. Why? Because the foolish woman plucked her own house down with her hands. You know the most blessed thing out there, and the Bible says, a virtuous woman, you know, her price is far, who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies? Why? The man goes out and he knows, I can trust my wife at home. I can trust her. I know that she doesn't need more than what we have. She's thankful. She has no pride. She doesn't care if other women look down their noses at her. She doesn't care if the women say, Oh, you're not wearing any jewelry. <laughs> she goes, Yeah, whatever. You know, don't need any. I got a good husband from the Lord. Hey, you know what, ladies? If you have a saved husband and he works hard to put food on the table and he has a provided a roof over your head, you better thank the Lord. You better be happy for that. And you shouldn't say, I need a bigger house. I need a better car. I need a better this. I need a better that. You're plucking down your house with your own hands. Don't be like Eve. Okay? Be a virtuous woman. Seek to be a virtuous woman. You say, well, my husband's no good. He's not worth shooting. Okay. Well, then pray for him. And encourage him in the things that he does do right if he's saved, if he's lost, well, then you got to start doing some major praying. But it says there, He that walketh in his uprightness feareth the Lord. Do you fear God? Well, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil and pride. You need to get a hold of that thing. In the mouth of the foolish is a rod of pride. Hey, when you get around people, do you boast about things? Do you try to make yourself look like you're somebody really important? Are you content to just take a humble place? You know what, one of the best things that you can do as a Christian? You ready? I'm going to show it to you. Keep your mouth shut. Oh, but I have to tell people, I have to get into conversation. Just shut up. When you're out there in the world and there's conversations and everything else, if you can witness for Jesus Christ, great. Open your mouth. But if it's conversations of the world and boasting about, I caught this fish, brother, when I was up in Alaska this one time, you should have seen the trophy, you know, the moose I shot. I'll tell you what, bigger than anything you've ever seen. Shut up if you're a Christian. Don't get pulled in. Don't let, there it says, the mouth of the foolish is a rod of pride. Don't let that thing come out of your mouth. Okay? The lips of the wise shall preserve them. Sometimes the best advice is keep your mouth shut. And it'll preserve you. It won't get you into trouble. Proverbs 16. Proverbs 16 verses uh, 18 through 20. Okay, it says here, 
Pride goeth before destruction, and an haughty spirit before a fall. Better it is to be an humble, to be of an humble spirit with the lowly, than to divide the divide the spoil with the proud. Yeah. Oh, brother, I got these business deals, you know, and stuff, and you want to be a big-time executive, and you want to make lots of money? You know, let's come on in here, man. I'll tell you what. I'll, I'll, let me tell you about the kind of money that you can make at this thing. Oh, no, thank you. I'm content with what the Lord's given me. See? Oh, but brother, you can divide the spoil with the proud. No, I'd rather stick with the humble and just be content with such things as I have. See? You're much better off that way. But pride goeth before destruction. So when you see a nation that is talking about gay pride and power of pride and pride, 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 and they're proud of their sin, you're looking at a nation that's just about ready to fall. And I don't know when it's going to happen. I don't know if we're going to fall before the rapture. I have no idea. I hope that it's after the rapture. Um, but if it doesn't happen until the rapture, I will guarantee you one thing. America will fall after the rapture. When the Holy Spirit and the bodies of Christians is yanked out of here, and for a time the Holy Spirit is not there to restrain the evil, whoo, boy, I praise the Lord that we aren't going to be here for that. <laughs> Without the restraining of the Holy Spirit upon this nation of America, it is going to be a nightmare. Horrible. You say, why? Well, because pride goes before destruction. Turn next to Proverbs 29. Proverbs 29, verse 23. It says here, A man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. Very true. You know, we read about there in uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, um, Verse 6, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Now what's that talking about? Well, it's talking about the judgment seat of Christ, but it's also talking about the millennial kingdom. Isn't it funny that some lowly Christian who's humble in this life comes back and rules and reigns with, reigns with Jesus Christ on the earth for a thousand years? Isn't that incredible? You know, now they look at you and they go, lousy Christian, what a loser. Oh, look at that guy. You know, what are you? You don't live on the, in the rich community or in a, in a mansion or things like that. You don't have any kind of political sway. You're not in the upper crust of society. It's like, no, but I will be one day. I'm going to be a member of the greatest royal family in the universe. And when I come back to rule and reign with Jesus Christ, I'm going to be high society. I might not look like it right now, but I will be one day. And if you're a Christian, you will be too. Okay? But if, you're, if you have pride now, it's going to bring you low. Alright, you're going to lose rewards. Because your pride is going to keep you from doing the work of the Lord. Your pride is going to keep you from being attacked and mocked for Jesus Christ. See? So you better bring yourself down a few notches. Humble yourself before the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time. Next, we're going to go to Daniel, chapter 4. One of the most powerful men who's ever existed. We're going to read about him here. Daniel, chapter 4, verse 28. This is where we're going to start out. It says here, All this came upon the king Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar was the first king of the very first one world government, the Babylonian Empire, the head of gold. Okay, This guy was an extremely powerful dictator slash king. I mean, this guy had pretty much the known world at his time under his authority. And if there was any place that wasn't known, you know, they would have been in subjection had they been discovered or whatever. I mean, this, is, this guy controlled everything. Verse 29, at the end of 12 months, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. The king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? Oh boy. Here he is, this great king, and he's walking around and he's saying, 
Look at all this kingdom. I have built it with my power, my majesty. It's all me. Look what happens. While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee. And they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee. Until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. Oh, but wait a second there. You see, the Illuminati, they, they, they pick people through you know, the Masonic Lodge and Skull and Bones, and they set things up, and nobody is able to get into power unless the Illuminati says so. Not true. You see, that verse there says, The Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. God sets up kings. God deposes kings. God sets them up. And what happens when you have a man and he's going around and he's saying, I have done this great stuff, me, my, you know, and all this stuff. God says, okay, buddy, your pride needs to be abased. You need to be brought down a few notches. And I'm going to do it. That's what the Lord says. Verse 33, the same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven from men and did eat grass as oxen, and his body was... was his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till his hairs were grown like eagles' feathers, and his nails like birds' claws. And at the end of the days I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? I love that. I mean, here's a guy, probably the most powerful politician that ever lived on the planet. Maybe outside of King Solomon. King Solomon was pretty powerful. But this man was extremely powerful. And God says, uh, You're going to give me honor and glory? Well, no, it's all my... It's, it's all on me. I'm the one who has the power and everything. And God says, okay, boom, you're an animal. And there's King Nebuchadnezzar out in the field, you know, you know, like an animal. People walking by the field and there's old King Nebuchadnezzar out there, old crazy King Nebuchadnezzar out there rooting around in the ground, you know, eating grass or something. You know, <laughs> what an image. What a thing. And you know, it's very interesting because I've heard a lot of people say, that perhaps King Nebuchadnezzar got saved. We'll continue reading here and we'll show you why they say that. It says, uh, verse 36, And this, at the same time my reason returned unto me, and for the glory of my kingdom mine honor and brightness returned unto me, and my counselors and my lords sought unto me, and I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added unto me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways judgment, and those that walk in pride, he is able to abase. Hmm. Wouldn't that be something to see King Nebuchadnezzar in heaven? There's a pretty good chance that he's going to be there. But what does it take? What did it take for him to get saved? To know that God loves him? No. To have his pride abased. And let me tell you something out there. If you're watching this video and you're not saved, you know what your problem is? You know what keeps you from getting saved? Your pride. What are my friends going to think? What are my coworkers going to think? What are people, my, my, the community here on YouTube or on Facebook or on whatever, what are they going to think? What's wrong with you? You're not willing to humble yourself. God's going to have to base that pride before you can be saved. Mm-hmm. Yeah. God's not interested in prideful men and women coming to him and saying, Hey, you, you, yeah, you, save me. All right? You're going to save me because I want to pray this prayer. I'm not going to change my life. I'm not going to do anything for you. You know, I'm just going to do what I want with my life. You know, you save me. God wants people coming to him in a broken state and saying, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. You know? Like the publican that smote upon his breast and said, God have mercy upon me, a sinner, you know? 
and he comes and he's broken before God. Kind of like Nebuchadnezzar here. Comes like an animal before the Lord. Those are the people that the Lord will, he's, he, that he'll listen to that he's interested in. All right, Not people that come in pride. He's not interested in that. Turn next to Obadiah. Obadiah. There are your minor prophets. Obadiah, there's only one chapter, so chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, says here, The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee, though thou dwellest in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, Who shall bring me down to the ground? Though thou exaltest thyself as the eagle, and though thou set thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. It's kind of funny because you have like in the cities, a lot of these rich, powerful people will they'll get penthouses, you know, up in the very tops of the skyscrapers, and they, like, live up there, you know, and they're like, you know, you can't even get up to my floor, because, you know, you're not as important as me, and I look down on the rest of the world, and ha, 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 you know, uh-huh. You know what chance they have of being saved? Very little. You know what it takes? For them to go from that high and lofty position and fall down, boom. <laughs> and I don't mean out of the window, I mean in pride. Had their pride be brought low, humble themselves before the Lord. Most people don't do that. Most people would rather go to hell than to humble themselves and be brought low. Most people are too proud to get saved. Turn next to Mark. These people may say, well, you know, I'm doing my best. I'm trying hard to get to heaven, you know, and... And I mean, I just, I think if I let my heart be my guide, you know, I'll, I'll be all right. I follow, just as long as you follow your heart, you know, just, just follow your heart. And, and God loves you and there's so much love in God and, and things. And, and he'll just, he just loves you and, and, and loves you and, and he, he loves you. <laughs> you know, that's the way it is. That's the way most people think. They have too much pride in them to admit to being a sinner. But what does Jesus Christ think about your heart? Mark chapter 7 verse 20. And he said, That which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, and evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness, all these evil things come from within and defile the man. Hmm. Are you proud to be an American? Do you have power of pride? If you do, you're evil. Mm -hmm. And you better get rid of that attitude if you expect to be saved. You better humble yourself before the Lord. You come to Him as a sinner. You don't come in your pride. You don't come and say, hey, this is the way it's going to be, God. Oh, no, you don't. No, you don't. Humble yourself before the Lord. You better not have power of pride. That's an evil thing that comes from within, and that's what defiles you, too, by the way. 1 Timothy chapter 3. You say, well, that's, you know, for the wicked, for the lost. Well, you know, partly, yeah, Christian can have those same evil things, you know. Just because you saved, or just because you got saved doesn't mean that your flesh got cleaned up. All right, your flesh is capable of sinning. Uh, so you got to watch out for that thing. But here's something that's a, a very specific warning, not just to Christians, but to pastors specifically. Okay, it says here, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, this is a true saying, If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth the good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Now look at this, verse 6. Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. 
You know, there's one thing that's very important for you as a Christian that you need to understand, and that is you don't want to get into ministry too quickly. You say, well, then you're saying I shouldn't, you know, go pass out tracts. No, you should start passing out tracts. You should start to witness immediately after salvation. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is don't expect to know all the very deepest doctrines just right away. It's going to take you some time. And you say, what happens if I go out right away and try to prove that I'm the big shot or something like that or really try to take on all kinds of big people? Well, there's a pretty good chance that you're going to get lifted up with pride. And then you're going to fall into the condemnation of the devil. All right? The devil's going to use you. And there's an awful lot of people out there that are novices, preachers that are novices. They haven't taken the time. They say, I started preaching when I was 13 years old. Give me a break. You're a novice. All right? You shouldn't be preaching for well into your late 20s, probably even after you're 30. I mean, Jesus Christ waited until he was 30 to start his earthly ministry. Are you better than him? You know? I mean, wait. Don't be a novice. Why? Because if you're a novice and you get out there and you don't know the Bible and you start yelling and screaming and stuff like that to, you know, a lot of these guys have to yell and scream, put on a big charismatic show to make up for their ignorance, for the fact that they don't really know the scriptures. And what happens is they get lifted up with pride. They draw people in because of the modulation of their voice, you see. They're exciting. They're riveting. They're really neat to listen to. They really get the flesh moving. You know, like that. See? And they go, people go, oh, wow, he can really preach the word. No, he can really put on a performance. He doesn't know the word, a lot of these guys. And what happens as a result is they get lifted up with their pride. All these people coming and saying, oh, pastor, you're so wonderful. Oh, you're so great. And then they're not correctable. And they fall into condemnation of the devil. And they're actually used by Satan. God doesn't use them. As a pastor, you have to remain humble. And as a Christian, the older you get, the more humble you will become. Not more prideful. Not more proud. Remain humble. That's so important. It's very important. 1 John chapter 2. Last place we're going to turn to today. 1 John chapter 2, verse 14 through 19. If you remember that earlier we read there in John chapter 8 about, you know, he that is of God heareth God's words, that ye therefore hear them not because you're not of God. Remember that as we go through these verses. 1 John chapter 2, verse 14 says, I have written unto you fathers because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because ye are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. Now here's a very important verse. Verse 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. See? That loving the world thing is pride. Leads to pride. Very important. Look at verse 16. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life hmm, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Very interesting. Verse 18. Little children, it is the last time, and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. You know, there's a, a thing I saw not too long ago, Kenneth Copeland, you know, and he has this, uh, they were talking about his mansion that he has in Texas, I think it is. And he has his own airport, and he has an, an airplane, which is like a 20-some million dollar airplane. And I thought to myself, how stupid. Look at verse 16 there. The pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world, and the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. Who's going to care about a 20 million dollar jet a hundred years from now? Nobody. What's that 20 million dollar jet going to look like in a hundred years? Rusted pile of junk. 
maybe it'll be sitting in an aviation museum someplace and they'll say people used to actually fly in them things actually you know honestly everything's going to be wiped out you know in the time of Jacob's trouble and we'll be in the millennial kingdom we won't care about airplanes but the point is my point I'm trying to make is you know what was highly esteemed a hundred years ago what is it today rusted junk you know I heard of a house a real big historic house in this area you know and and it was just I mean, just gigantic, huge, big mansion. I mean, huge, big place. I, I forget how many bedrooms it had, like 20-some bedrooms or something like this. I mean, just an enormous old mansion. Things falling apart. It took them years just to fix the, the leaks in the roof. But I bet it was something in its day. Boy, I bet you those people that lived there, I bet you they had some real pride. Oh, you live at the such and such manner. Oh, 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 you know. You're the governor and his wife. Oh. What's their house now? Old run-down place that the owners are just trying to keep it going, trying to keep it from falling in. Mm -hmm. You better not set your affection on things down here on this earth because everything down here is subject to the second law of thermodynamics. Big word there. You know, what is that? The law of entropy. Everything rots. Everything gets worse with time. See? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, brother, I'm, I can't agree with you because I'm working hard, and pretty soon I'm going to have enough money saved up to buy a Corvette. And you know what happens? You go in there and you pay whatever. I don't even know what they are now. Fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 for a Corvette. You drive it off the lot. Drive it down a mile down the road, say, oh, maybe I shouldn't have done this. I'm going to go back to the dealership, get my money back. You pull it back into the dealership and you say, I want my money back for this brand new Corvette. They'll say, uh, it's not brand new. Well, it only has two miles on it, one mile down the road, one mile back to the dealership. They say, yeah, but it's used. We can only give you 40000 for it. I lost that much money? Mm -hmm. You keep it a few more years, you'll lose even more. You know? Now, maybe you know, they'd give you more than 40000 but my whole point is, anything that you get on this earth, you buy it, it will depreciate in value. You say, what about a house? You know, you buy real estate, it gets it appreciates. Yeah, because you're constantly putting money into it. You know? Whatever you do in this life, brother, sister, it's going downhill. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ, only when you submit to this book, only what you do what this book tells you to do, that's the only thing that's going to make it into eternity. The only thing. And if you get caught up by the pride of life, if you look out there at this world and you say, I'd like to serve the Lord with my life, but, uh, boy, I just, I'm worried about my career. Because if I stay with my career and if I work really, really, really hard, I'll have a good retirement someday and I'll be able to have all the money and all the things and, and everything else. Let's just say that you do that, okay? Let's say you live for 90 years, 100 years, and you work for 40 or 50 or 60 years and you save up and you have retirement and you, everything else and you have a beautiful home that's paid for and you're able to go to a nice nursing home and you have nice vehicles and you have everything that you want in this life. Most people don't have that. But if you have all of that stuff, what's it going to matter in eternity if you never took time out to serve Jesus Christ? What's it going to matter? Not going to mean anything. You say, but I had the pride of life. I had lots of good things in this world. I had lots of good riches. Yeah, and now there's somebody else's. And let me speak to the Christians that are alive right now. Okay? Think about where you're at prophetically. Hey, you know something? One of these days, you're going to hear a voice that says, Come up hither. And you're going to leave. And all the things in your home are going to be the property of somebody else. Oh, but brother, I don't want to live in a in a little shack someplace, or I don't want to I don't want to sacrifice my career. I, I mean, because I'm I'm really working hard for my retirement. You better think about that. 
Um, I don't think most people are going to ever see retirement. I think the Lord's going to come back. And when that time comes, everything is left behind. If the rapture happens within the next couple of minutes here, somebody's going to come into this building here and they're going to find this shirt right here. They're going to find my wedding ring. They're going to find this Bible laying there. My glasses, my shoes, the keys to my vehicle. They're going to find it all. And you know what I'm going to be taking to heaven? Only what I did for Jesus Christ. My service for Jesus Christ. That's the only thing that's going with me. That's it. You better not fall for the sin of pride. You better not care what other people think of you in this life. You better set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Because if you're only thinking about what's going on down here and you're worried what people think about you, worried about what people think about your house, is it big enough? Worried about your vehicle, is it new enough? Worried about your clothes, are they stylish enough? Worried about whatever, your career, whatever else. You're off the mark. I can tell you that. You're off from where the Lord wants you to be. Do not fall for the sin of pride. That's going to be it. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word, Lord, and I thank you uh, for what you've done for us on the cross, Lord, that, that we can truly say that we are saved and that we know we're saved, um, not because we have pride, Lord, but because of the fact that we have humbled ourselves and come to you as sinners and put our faith in your shed blood on the cross, your death, burial, and resurrection, and the fact that we have your word, Lord, that we can know about all these things, that we can be warned about the pride of life and the things down here that entangle men and that, and that draw them in and cause them to get away from earning rewards in heaven. And I pray, Lord, for the viewers out there that they would not uh, succumb to these things, Lord, but they, would, they, would, they wouldn't care about what the world thinks of them. I just pray, Lord, that they would think about setting their affections on things above and not on things on this earth. And I just uh, pray all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, two quick ministry little announcements here. First of all, I want to thank everybody for praying for the uh, young Catholic woman that I mentioned. Well, former Catholic. Um, real amazing answer to prayer. Uh, I actually was contacted by her in the, in the past week here. Her mother has accepted the Lord. So, praise the Lord for that. Uh, another soul on their way to heaven. Uh, just, I'm just so happy about it. Just filled with joy. I just, wow. And uh, so there's two people that are on their way to heaven that previously were not. And I thank all my viewers out there, everybody that uh, was praying. Thank you. Prayer does work. Prayer changes things. So uh, that one. And the second announcement, uh, we have been working, my wife over there and myself, we have been working now on uh, this study about um, where did Baptist church buildings come from. Uh, I know some of you are getting sick and tired of me ripping on buildings all the time, but we found some things, brothers and sisters, that you aren't going to believe. Um, some very, very wild information. Uh, I just, I'm quite shocked by some of it, to be very honest with you, some of the history of these, uh, of the Baptist system. Um, and before you get all excited out there, if you're an independent fundamental Baptist, um, doctrinally, mostly I am the same way, but I don't call myself a Baptist simply because it's a label. I don't really see any labels in, in Scripture. And so I'm just a King James Bible-believing Christian. That's all I am. Sinner saved by grace. That's, that's me. But uh, I'm not coming out and attacking Baptists, singling them out as this wretched apostate organization. I'm simply saying that doctrinally you might be all right, but in practice there are some very, very serious errors. Very serious. And I'm going to be saying some things that are going to shock a lot of you, okay, in this study. Um, right now, just to show you here, this is my sermon notes for this week's sermon. It's two pages, you know, two pages. This study that we have with all the documentation, all the photographs, all the uh, links to websites. I'm actually going to have a PDF for this sermon 
one of the first ones I've ever done. I've, I have a couple that I have PDFs for, but this one's going to have a PDF file. I mean, I'm going to, I'm documenting what I'm saying. In other words, it's not going to be just my attitude rant and raving for a long time. But this PDF is 27 pages right now. So it's a very, very, very detailed study. I mean, my wife and I both have been working on this. She's actually been working on it longer than I have, documenting things. I tell her, please look this up, please look that up. God's blessed me with a wife that can do that type of work, research for me. Um, so I, I praise the Lord for her for that. But this information is earth-shattering. Okay, some of the stuff we found out. Um, I don't want to get ahead of myself. I don't want to spoil it, but it's crazy. So we're going to be bringing this study out. Uh, we were going to record it today, but it's been raining off and on. I see the sun's out again, and it's probably going to get dark and rain some more. But uh, hopefully, Lord willing, tomorrow um, we'll be able to record this thing. And I'm going to have to put a lot of text and pictures in, in it and everything else. So it should be out the next week or two. It's going to be the first part, and there's going to be another part coming up after that. I'll talk more about that when we get into the study, but it's a big, 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 big issue. Very big issue. Probably one of the most important things I've ever talked about. And uh, so look for that. And uh, please pray for us with this whole thing too because we are... Uh, another reason I'm saying that this is a very big study is because we have experienced more spiritual warfare with our research for this thing than anything I've ever done in the past. Uh, it's incredible. I got very, very violently ill the one time and I mean it was just... <laughs> it's been rough. So I don't imagine the devil's going to be real happy when this information comes out. And uh, so I'm sure there's going to be a lot of warfare issues between now and the time that it's released on YouTube. So um, please pray for us. Pray that the Lord protects us as we do this study. And uh, we'll get this thing out. So that's going to be it for today. Thank you very much for watching this video. And I pray that you can get pride out of your life. And even out of your vocabulary, like I said at the beginning of this video, don't be going around saying, I sure am proud of this or I'm proud of that. I am well pleased with this. Your son does something good, your daughter, your wife does something good, your husband does something You say, I'm really well pleased with you. Okay, get rid of that word pride out of your vocabulary. All right, thank you for watching.